Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the name above all names. Come glorify, come testify of the name above all names. Come glorify, come testify of the name Lord Jesus, Jesus, no other name is given. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the name above all names, the name above. Oh, Jesus, the Lord Jesus, no other name, no other name is given. Oh, Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the name above. All names in my life, Lord, be glorified. In my life today, in my life, be glorified. In my life today. In the midst of his church, he sings praises. In the midst of your church, you sing praises. And I will sing the praise with you, Lord. In the midst of your church. In the midst of your church, you sing praises. And I will praise with you. And I will praise with you, Lord. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, be magnified. Sing it again. Be magnified. Now fill it real deep as the Holy Ghost makes it deep. Jesus. Lord Jesus, Jesus, be magnified. Say, Holy Spirit, come testify through me. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come testify. Come testify through me. Amen. Just get filled up now. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Just let the praises of the Lord flow out. <laughs> let the thanksgiving to His name be in you. Just sing, 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 hum, sing, hum, sing, hallelujah, sing, holy, sing, Jesus, just sing. Let the praises of the King now fill ya. Let the praises of the King now fill ya. Let 
Let the praises of the King now thrill ya. Let the praises of the seeking now fill ya. Hallelujah. You can, you can be seated. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you know what you're saying? Do you know what you're saying when you say hallelujah? Huh? A lot of different religions have tried to use the word, but it's addressing praises to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Yahuwah. Amen. To address him, standing here right now, you sitting right where you're at. If your eyes would be open, you would realize that you're actually talking directly to him. We pray in Jesus' name that revelation would touch you right now. You won't just be singing a song, but you'd be addressing the Almighty God, right? This very moment, God has given us the privilege and the opportunity to do so. And when we begin to realize it, when relationship begins to open up our eyes, it causes us to know that we're not just speaking out into the air. But as Jesus said, Father, I know you always hear me, and I know you hear me now, but for their sakes, I'm going to say it out loud real, real strong so everybody can hear the prayer that I'm praying. Lord, I know you always hear me. Do you know that he always hears you? Hear you? Do you know that he always hears you? In that, say, thank you, Lord Jesus. See, when it's not just a responsive thing anymore, but you're really addressing the king. You're talking directly to the living God. Things will change. If there's anything that God's people need to be, they need to be expert in being sensitive to the presence of the living God. So many things desensitize you. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, pleasures of this world, desensitize you. Hurts, problems, issues, concerns, discouragements, disappointments. Relationship problems, they desensitize you. But right now, in the, by the authority that is in the name of Jesus Christ, I set you free from all that mess. I bring you up out of that whatever prison you may be in. Those things that would make your heart hard and calloused. Because God's new covenant, the new society that he's brought us into called the heavenly realm or the kingdom of the beloved son, or your King James people, kingdom of the dear son, is a wonderful and a glorious realm. Where you can know him personally, interact with him right now, be overwhelmed with him, his presence. He gave you a new heart and he gave you a new spirit. He took the stony heart out and gave you a heart of flesh so it could be sensitive. Huh? People let all kinds of stuff desensitize them. God works a miracle of salvation. And then the Holy Ghost comes to teach us and lead us and guide us and to show, how to, show us how to walk in this wonderful life. But people, many people choose other things. And then they find themselves... Maybe deep in religion, deep in knowledge, deep in information, but far from the presence. The beautiful thing of it is God's mercy and his grace is so wonderful. Hallelujah. You just repent a little bit. Huh? Just repent a little bit. Ha. Huh? Just repent. Call upon his name. Say, Lord, come help me. Well, God, come restore the joy of your salvation to me. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, uh, let me just feel your presence. Let me be overwhelmed with your love right now. Let me be overwhelmed with your joy right now. Let me be overwhelmed with your peace right now. And he just comes, brings, opens up floodgates. Tell me more, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. 
How many of you know this song? More of his saving fullness see. More of his love that died for me. If you didn't know it, now you know it. So, pretty easy. More, tell me more, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness. More of His love that died for. I just want to know more, more about Jesus. Tell me more, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love. More of his love that died. Hallelujah. My grandpa was a Southern Baptist preacher who came into Pentecost in the 20s. And he sang songs like this and got him raptured right over into a realm of glory, lay hands on the sick, and whoever he laid hands on, they got healed. Pretty radical stuff. Just knowing about Jesus, the Holy Ghost has come to reveal Jesus and make him known. So tell me more, more. About Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of His saving fullness, more of His love that died. For me, more about Jesus I would learn, more of His holy will discern, Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. Holy Spirit, tell me more, more about Jesus. Oh, more, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness, see. More of His love that died for me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Almighty God. We bless and praise you, Lord, for all you've done. You know, when you're around me and the church that I'm in, you can go ahead and just worship and sing in the Spirit all you want. In the church that I belong to, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. And speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs if you know how to. I know people you've been conditioned to believe it's rude. <laughs> Let me help you understand something. The only thing's rude is rebellion in the house. Yeah. The only thing rude is things that are out of order. Things that aren't true and right before the Lord. Huh? Yeah. 
worship, praise. But you know, Father, he said, you know, I've been, I've been earnestly desiring to have something real among the men that I've created. I've been so hungry for them to be able to worship in the Holy Ghost and in truth. King James described it in, in John chapter 4. I've been so earnest for them to worship in spirit and truth. And uh, I know King James used the word seeketh such. Zelotes, in Greek, the Greek language, to earnestly desire something. Father, I've been earnestly desiring somebody. You let the Holy Ghost fill you with the Spirit of the Son, I'm going to tell you right now, the Son knows how to love on Father. The Father loves the Son, reveals all things to Him. Christ Jesus, the only begotten Son, because Father was so earnest, so that for someone, anyone, in fact, everyone, but He would do with just one, to worship Him in spirit and in truth, He sent the Word and made Him His only begotten Son and took upon Himself the robes of sinful flesh to be rejected, despised, totally misunderstood, to go all the way to Calvary's cross with joy for you and me, to take away the sin and the shame, to release us from the present, the, the, the prison of human concerns and demonic influences, so that with the blood of Jesus Christ being washed and cleansed and being sanctified by that wonderful work of grace, the Holy Spirit could come and work the miracle of the new race. I like to use new terms to shock people. <laughs> because we talk about born again, everybody believes they know what that means. Born of the Spirit, born of the living God, to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. And then to have the fruits that testify of the reality. Unfortunately, there's been many who come into the kingdom of God and they were immediately, as it were, swept up by religion and they learned the wrong things. My whole purpose in life is to turn people back to God. My purpose in life is to turn people to the Word of God and to the Spirit of the living God. That's why the Lord anointed me. Amen. Amen. I've been standing here prophesying for 35 years. I don't care how long it takes, we'll prophesy that much longer. I know what Papa's going to do. I know what our Heavenly Father is going to do. He's going to glorify He's the only begotten son. He's going to get his boast. He's looking for some people to agree with him. Father, just, Jesus said, all authority is given me in heaven and earth. I'm just looking for somebody to agree with me. See, we say, well, all authority is given to Jesus in heaven, but we out here on our own. That ain't it. That's not what's going on. All authority is given unto Jesus, both in heaven and earth. He has been set far above all principality and power and might in every dominion. Every name that is named, not only in this world, and in, but also in the world to come. He's given his church for the purpose of having the manifest reality of all of his fullness of his glory, even, yes, even under the fullness of God, which encompasses everything and every dimension of the power of God. He's the fullness of the power of God made body. Fullness of the power of God embodied into a, as it were, a single person. I know King James said in, when Paul wrote, uh, spoke this message, fullness of the Godhead made bodily. For ye are complete in him and he is the fullness of the Godhead made bodily. Gone has taken all of his fullness, all the fullness of everything that expresses who he is and what he is and what he's done in all of his life and all of his goodness. And he's embodied all that fullness in Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus embodied all that fullness into the church. Now, you know, I'm, there's people on Twitter right now tweeting all the, tweeting all the <laughs> verses of Scripture. At word, going forth. At word going forth. If you want to get these verses of Scripture. They just help me so I can go a little faster. 
because what's happened is we recognize that people have been conditioned just to hear whatever's coming out of people's mouth, ministry's mouth. They don't even know if it's the scripture or not. In fact, people are more commonly used to hearing philosophical ideology, Christian philosophy, more than the hearing the word of God. I love the fact that when the, uh, the church during the days uh, right after John had died, uh, the last of the apostles, um, there was a, a young man who went around taking care of John. He was like a personal assistant of John. His name was Polycarp. And the church at Philippi said, would you please... Before you die, because he was always in trouble. He was always up against popular religion. He was, always, he was just that way, because he hung around John. John. John was against religion. No time for religion. We'd just been brought into relationship. I'll tell you the difference between religion and relationship. Religion can be stubborn and arrogant, have its own way, and be insensitive to the presence of the living God. The Almighty God can come stand in the midst of religion, and religion is say it's a devil. That's what the Pharisees did to Jesus. That's what religion would do. Jesus would stand and preach the greatest. Jesus preached the greatest sermon that had ever been preached on the planet ever in the history of men. And the results of that sermon was that they what took him out and was going to throw him off the cliff. Jesus did one of the disappearing acts. He was able to disappear when he wanted to. Five times in the Bible he disappeared. The scripture says he passed through the midst of them. Huh? When a bunch of people got a hold of you, huh? Grab my baby here. A bunch of people got a hold of you, right? Huh? And they're taking you somewhere. This happened five times, Lord. And, and you passed through the midst of them, you disappeared. <laughs> but, the Lord always, but the Lord always raises up prophets and men of God who are radical. So everybody can hate them for a period of time. And then ultimately, they, people that changes. Changes the culture. It turns the hearts back because you can only hate the prophets of God just so long. Huh? Then the word works on mightily on the inside of you. Explosion comes in, in the midst of the church. What happens usually is young people get touched by the power of God because young people are radical. They want truth. Usually they're visionary. They want, look, man, I'm tired of this just nonsense playing game stuff. Give me the real thing. Huh? And that's where a new revival emerges. Young man named Evan Roberts. He's always been very dear to my heart since I was, very, since I was really young. I mean, I heard about how Evan Roberts, what God did through the singing revival in Wells and that, broke, that started in September 28, 2004. I mean, just, you know, huh? 1904. And... Uh, you know, here's a young man who's 12 years old. He says, he says, because he's a pastor, because Wells, you can almost set the clock by it. They have a, a great move of God over 30 or 40 years. And so all that Evan Roberts ever heard was the testimonies about those great revivals. And it had been about 20 years or so since one of those great revivals had swept Wells in the, in the in UK. He says, so he's saying to his pastor, what do I got to do? What do we got to do in order to get to be a part of one of those great revivals that's happened in our nation? These great moves of God where we hear people talk about being overwhelmed by the presence of God in such a way they couldn't move or they were translated into heaven and had open visions of Jesus and revelations of all the things that belong to us right now in the kingdom. What will it take? What will it take? So his pastor said, listen, Evan, just be in all of the meetings. Just come to all of the meetings because you do not know when the power of God is going to move. But whenever that opportunity comes, when the power of God begins to move... If you're there, if you're, if you're ready to receive, you'll step into something that otherwise will be not available to you. So he took it to heart. He was in all the meetings. And then he started doing more meetings. And they just had a little group of people. They had about 12 or 14 people. 
but they were being led by just a radical person. And so when you get led by a radical person, you get pretty radical. The Lord would wake up, would wake Evan Roberts up at 1 o'clock in the morning, and he just had a routine, pray, for, pray from 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning, go back to sleep, get it back up, do it again at 9, and then go off to work. But see, that was, you can't, you, you try to do that out of yourself, you, you know, you're just going to be, wear yourself out. But when all of a sudden you so yielded yourself over to the Spirit of God, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not meaningful to you anymore. The things that Satan would try to do to pull you into a realm of iniquity has lost its hold and power. Now the will of the Father permeates your very will passions and desires and he's able to call you apart unto himself and begin to do things through you that are absolutely necessary and essential for revival to come for an awakening to, awakening to come I think about Charles Finney and how God used that lawyer transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost to so Sweep the United States of America with a fiery revival. But Charles Finney just wouldn't really have had the ministry he had without Father Nash. Father Nash built the church and by the time he was 42 years old, they said they wanted a younger preacher and he had to get over rejection pretty quick. He built the thing from nothing and now, you know, they got a bunch of people in there and they voted him out. But he found a place of solitude with God. He found a place of relationship with the Lord. His heart began to become more sensitive to God because he didn't take on offense. I think the spirit of offense takes more people out, desensitizes more people. Oh, mighty God. I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll come to understand what it means to be born again, to come into the new race of the, of the people of God who are, have, who are born of the Spirit and received a new heart and a new spirit. You don't have an old wicked heart from which proceeds every evil and vile thing, fornications and idolatry and all forms of wickedness. You got a new heart and out of it is flowing the issues of life, the issues of the presence of the living God. Out of your heart and even out of your belly, out of the depths of your emotions, Flowing this wonderful expressions of the living God. Let me just say this to you, dear people. I want to talk to you a little bit here this morning on this subject of Luke chapter 3 and verse 16. Most people know John chapter 3 and verse 16. How many of you know John chapter 3, verse 16? They hold it up at all the football games, most of the baseball games. Somebody's got a sign. Raise your hand if you know John 3, 16. If you, now raise your hand, other hand if you can quote it. Me, my mama brainwashed me by the time I was two years old. I was brainwashed with the Word of God. I mean, she didn't teach me how to say much, but she taught me how to, I mean, other outside of the Bible, but she taught me the Bible. So that early on in life, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life, this unlimited, undiminishing, immeasurable life. But Luke chapter... Luke chapter 3, verse 16 is just as important as, Luke, as John chapter 3, verse 16. Luke chapter 3, verse 16 declares the word of John the Baptist, which was Jesus' cousin. Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. Mary went up to be with Elizabeth for a number of reasons. Most importantly is that she had uh, conceived a child by the Holy Ghost. And nobody in her village is going to believe that. Huh? Nobody's going to believe she's received a child by the Holy Ghost. And so the Lord just took, she sent her up there to be with Elizabeth, her cousin. And her Elizabeth, her cousin, was already with child who would be the prophet that would go before Christ Jesus, preparing the way of the Lord, even in the spirit of Elijah, except for he would do no miracles. Only the authority of God would be heard manifested through the words which she spoke. 
the, the aroma of the fear of the Lord would be felt as he preached. And many in Israel would come and be baptized with the water of repentance. They'd be baptized in water, given the privilege and the power to repent. No, I'm telling you, it, was, it would have been an amazing thing to see what all would have taken, taken place during those days of John because, you know, it was a special anointing that he had. Jesus said no greater prophet had existed since the day of John. Did you know that Jesus said that? And when I think about Moses the prophet, when I think about Elijah the prophet, my goodness, it was amazing what would have been happening around John. And what I believe was happening around John was a manifest presence of the living God had been contained only in the holies of holies was being released upon people as he would preach. Ultimately to have its moment of uh, its, its ultimate moment when the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, uh, heavens were opened, the um, uh, Holy Spirit came down and rested without measure upon Christ Jesus. And they were thinking and you read it there in Luke chapter 3. I know all of you have your Bibles out. And I'm sure that all of you have photographic memory. I just think that some of you, your film ran out. And so it's better to go ahead and open up your notes, turn to your reference point. You know, God took your notes for you. Isn't that good? Huh? Huh? I mean, I was, listen, when I went to school, man, especially, especially, I mean, you know what? Mo molecular biology was tough and genetics was tough. But my goodness, microbiology, all of those new terminologies, all those new words, goodness, there's a whole new dictionary you have to learn, you know. And so, basically, best thing to do is go find the smartest person in the class and get their notes, okay. And then you would be good to go because they're really clever and they know what the teacher's going to ask. You can't study all that information anyways. just need to study exactly what's important for you to be able to pass the test. Especially if you have an ambition, you know, to go to medical school. You're going to have to have some really good grades. And, and so the Lord put, his, put all the notes together for us. He's the smartest person in the class. All the notes are ready. They're already written out. You don't really need to add to this. Just underline, highlight. Before long, you'll have your whole Bible underlined, highlighted, several different colors for each individual verse of Scripture because all of it is exquisitely important for every one of us. Hallelujah. Just hang on, you're going to get the interpretation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tongues are, tongues are for the excelling. And uh, Paul said, if I come to you, just for those of you who may not know, because I can't contain these things in the spirit. Uh, Paul said, if I come to you speaking in tongues, of course he did. He said, I'll come to you speaking in tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 6. I figure I better go ahead and give this reference so you don't have to go to the Twitter to get this one because this is a big one for people. But at any rate, he said, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what should it profit you lest I also speak by, uh, by revelation, by knowledge, by prophecy, and by doctrine? And so that's where, where excels to. Amen. Amen. Also excels into the realms of love, hallelujah, to the realms of joy, hallelujah. All the life of God. Have you been experiencing the life of God? Have you been born of the Spirit? Then you, are, you have the privilege of experiencing the life of God. Have you allowed the Holy Ghost to come and lead you and guide you? Come, come walk with you and walk in you. Come fill you and baptize you. Then you've experienced in the life of God. The life of God that Moses seen there that day when the Lord said to him, he said, I'm long-suffering and I, I'm merciful and gracious and long-suffering. I'm full of goodness and truth. If you, are you experiencing that abundant life, that life immeasurable, unending, the very life of God, the life that is full of joy, unspeakable, and full of glory, the life that has peace that passes understanding. Hallelujah. The boom, the life, the life that has the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Because when you do and you drink of this water, it is a wellspring of life springing up with all of these good things. And, this, and, and the powers of darkness are going to be able to take you out. They're not going to be able to lead you away into the sin and the iniquity. Understand, Christ Jesus writes to the overcomer. You better believe it. You're not going to have sin in your life and be right with God. Not for one second, not for one moment. 
Father in His mercy has made a way of escape. He's made a way for us to, to, to be delivered out of the wrath of God that is going to be revealed. There's no question about the wrath of God will be revealed against sin. But first and foremost, God came with His love to reveal His grace and His mercy to all men. Yeah. You don't want to refuse that love. That love transforms our lives. That love fills us with every good thing that pertains to life and godliness. That love fills us with every good and perfect gift. That love fills us with the very presence of the living God himself. However, if you're religious, you're going to be thirsty for the world. Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. If you drink of this gift that I have, you'll never thirst again. However, if all you drank of was with the bitter waters of religion, you're still thirsty. And therefore, what God has and the things that go on in the realms of heaven will not satisfy you because you're insensitive to them. You're not benefiting from them. I tell you what goes on in heaven will satisfy you. But you're going to have to participate. You're going to have to learn how to receive that which God supplies abundantly, immeasurably. <laughs> He says, I feel you. Somebody said, how full will you get? You'll be so full that it will be as rivers of his life, rivers of the expressions of the Holy Ghost issuing out of you. I spend my life talking to people about these things, and they look at me with an intellectual poise that has no comprehension of what's being said. Yeah. But God, the Holy Ghost, would come and open up your eyes. The Spirit of God will come and reveal to you this immeasurable grace. So of his full saving fullness, see more of that love that died for me. Tell me more. Holy Spirit's come for one reason, to tell you more. He's come to reveal Jesus and to make him known. He's come to glorify Jesus. He's come to take everything that belongs to Jesus. Which Jesus said parenthetically there in John chapter 14, verse 14. All that the Father has is mine. The Holy Ghost has come. Take all of it and reveal it to you. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Or are you filled up and satisfied and drunk on the things of this world? You have to decide. Are you red hot or are you cold? Are you you rather lukewarm? Because usually what goes on in the midst of the church is lukewarm. And Jesus is very clear on it. That I'll spew you out of my mouth to Hebrewism says, I have no relationship with you. I have no, you have no part with me. We live in an age that is under the influence of rebellion. You know what the opposite of submission is? Rebellion. God's taught us to come and be subjected or submitted to the realms of his divine glory where every bit of the good things of heaven would flow to us and every dimension of God's own character and nature would be expressed to us. But there is a force that saturates the very atmosphere that we're breathing. Paul said it. He said it in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3. He said, this, he said that Satan, he describes Satan as the god of this world, the prince and the power of the atmosphere. Huh. People, God's calling you come to know him. God's calling you to come and understand what he has for you. And John, rather in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, John says this. When they're wondering if he's the Christ, he's going to let them know that he's not the Christ. He said, I baptize you with water under repentance. But there is coming one, there is coming a mighty one, one mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie or, or unloose or unbuckle. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I want you to look here, dear people. He comes, Christ Jesus, we know Luke was the one who was the recorder of this message. And that's why I'm taking up Luke chapter 3, verse 16, rather than taking it from Matthew. I'm wanting you to see Luke chapter 3, verse 16, because Luke is the same one that God used to inscribe and write out Acts. And go and look at what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. He said, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. We know exactly what John is talking about. We know exactly what God is referring to in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. 
all the various different speculations that people have of what that is, is invalid. It is only revealed right there at Pentecost because Jesus himself, in the la one of the last things he said to the church before he left this earth and ascended up into heaven, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now, Acts 1.5. He had already said also with that in Luke chapter 24, verse 48 and 49. He said, go tarry in Jerusalem until you, in, you receive the promise of the Father and you're endued with power from on high. The very promise of the Father was over and again spoken by his prophets where he said, I'll pour out the glory of heaven. I'll pour out water upon dry land. I'll bring forth these wonderful issues of life. Over and again, especially by the prophet Isaiah. And here it is. This is the time, Pentecost. Somebody wants to come along and say, oh, well, Jesus only baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire in the first century church? Well, that's ludicrous. That is total nonsense. Because those same people that will say that will call uh, folks like, uh, like Clement of Alexandria or Jerome or Justin Martyr or Arrhenius, or a list of others, church fathers. And those, those who they would call church fathers testified of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, of the gift and the working of the Spirit, of the signs and the wonders and the miracles of their day, even after the 5th and 6th century. So somebody's going to have to get on page with what it is they really believe and who it is they really follow. If you're going to follow Augustine, then follow him all the way. Don't try to somehow... Excuse yourself from the Word of God and the experience that God demands because ultimately you'll find yourself deceived in any religion. And many people today are deceived. We know as the day is approaching, the day of the Lord, seducing spirits will wax worse and worse. They, people will, will be deceived and go about deceiving. There's a lot of people who had the wool pulled over your eyes. You've been lied to. And all the time you had the word of God you could have gone to, you could have read, you could have earnestly sought out these things in the scripture. This treasure of life could have been more valuable to you than anything. It could have been like a pearl of great price and like a treasure hid in the field for which you were willing to go sell everything. You make the choice as to where you're going to put your interest in your times, what you value, what's important to you. Many people, the most important thing to them is, is a career and a job and making more money and having a bigger savings account and having more investments. I'm telling you right now, that what you labor for right now may take care of you for a month. But when you begin to sow into the Spirit, you'll reap those things which will take care of you and last forever. Where is your value? Where is your wisdom? Where is your insight? The Lord says when you get a new heart and a new spirit, He'll put His Spirit on the inside of you, the same Spirit that He Himself has, that Christ Jesus revealed, that Isaiah prophesied of and testified of in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. He gave unto Him the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord. He gave unto Him the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. He gave unto Him the Spirit of counsel and, 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 and might or really strength or valor or power gave unto him the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. These things should be in you and living in you and they should be able to be seen and, and felt and, and heard and they should pr produce results in your life that causes you to walk out a walk that God describes the very nature of it and description of it in his word. Why is it that people want to have a false witness? They want to believe other things rather than God's report. I pray in the name of Jesus, you'll be converted today. You'll repent and you'll come into the kingdom of God because God loves you so much. He paved the way for you with the blood of Jesus. He opened the door with you. By, he opened the door for you by the broken body and torn flesh of the only begotten son. He's poured out all heaven's divine power and glory, urging you, calling you, begging you, petitioning you. You will be out without excuse on that day. I'm here to warn you. You didn't get here by accident. God loves you so much he drew, drew you here to this place, calling you for a change. He wants your life to change. People say, well, if God loves me, I hear this all the time. Oh, if, if they love me, they'll accept me the way I am. No, that's not true. God ain't going to accept you the way you are. He'll call you the way you are. To change you to be like him. But he ain't going to accept the way you are. He's not going to have anything, any fellowship with sin and iniquity. Never has had, not will not have today, and never will have in the future. 
He made a way for us to be changed. He made a way for us to escape. He made a way for us to become a new creation, to become a new man. Hallelujah. Here he's come to baptize us. Listen, dear people, not just fill us. Huh? Of course, when you know when you know when you read the words fill, it's actually actually equated to baptism. Because you say, I'm gonna bap, you're gonna be baptized, and the day that they got baptized, it said they were all filled. So really, to be filled and to be baptized are interchangeable. And to understand the description of being baptized is to watch what John was doing as people went down and were completely immersed, surrounded by, engulfed for a whole body, as it were, cleansing and a cleansing ritual that exists. Not only as John ministered, but also there was there incorporated in the group of the Essenes. People, God wants to grab hold of your attention. God wants to grab hold of you. There's manifestations going on all the time. Things pulling you away. Things distracting you. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. God wants to change your life. He doesn't want you to go on in your poverty, spiritually and naturally. He doesn't want you to go on in your poverty, physically, being sick and diseased in your body. God doesn't want you to continually have no defense against the powers of darkness. Listen to me. That's why Paul said, be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of his might so you can stand against all the tricks of Satan. Be sure of this. If you're not strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of his might, you won't be able to stand against all the tricks of Satan. And then you're not going to have the life of the overcomer. And Jesus gives to us a message and a confidence for the life of those who overcome. See, back in my grandpa's day, Back in Grandpa's Christmas Day. Can you find a seat? Just sit down. If you need to be prayed for, I'll pray for you right now. Happy to pray for you. You'll be all right. If you're sick and diseased in your body, Christ Jesus is here to heal you. If you're confused and depressed in your spirit, Christ Jesus is here to deliver you. He's not going to leave you in the same state that you're in. However, it's your choice because he's not making anybody do anything. He's not going to force anybody to do anything. Back in my grandpa Creasman's day, just Southern Baptist minister, it was different. Because back in that day, back in the 20s, everybody knew, no matter what their doctrinal belief was, ultimately, they all knew if you had sin in your life, you would die and go to hell. That there had to be a change. That you had to learn how to not allow sin and iniquity in your life. Always that wonderful banner of God's divine grace saying if you do sin, there's, a, there's the means by which you can be cleansed and forgiven. But what's happened now because we are now approaching the day of the Lord and now we are moving that much faster and that much closer to the finality of apostasy. Now we've come to a place where, oh, you could sin more or less every day because we're all unrighteous and it's no big deal. Now people's, now people's hearts and lives are made hard through the deceitfulness of sin. They've lost sensitivity to the one who's come to convict us of sin, the Holy Ghost, who's come to reprove us of sin, who's come to reveal the righteousness of God to us. The sweet aroma of the fear of the Lord is not something that is really smelt much anymore. And you have to ask yourself, where, where, do, you, where do you stand? Everybody wants to say, well, I'm not lukewarm and I'm not cold. I'm surely on fire. Well, if you're on fire, that means you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. And the expressions of the living God and the passions of God and the ways of God are being expressed in your life. You don't defy your pastors. You're not rebellious, you're not arrogant, you're not seeking your own, you're not walking your own way. People don't realize that the, how the rebellion has swept the our nation. My grandfather, Christmas Day, pastors, my goodness, leaders, they had the respect that you read about in Ephesians chapter 4. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers were there for the perfecting of the saints. And the saints recognized, I'm not perfected without them. They are there for the building up of the body of Christ and the churches are going to be built up without them. There was a reverence there. So they actually had to use the word reverend to just simply as a, as a framework of reverence. And of course, you know, Paul used that in, in, in also in relationship to how wives are supposed to respond to their husband. Says, let the, he says in verse 31, let, but let the wife reverence her husband. <laughs> That's I mean, people are going to call 911 because I said that. <laughs> Reverence, what are you talking about? Sarah called Abraham Lord. She's the model. My goodness, that, that's false doctrine. 
No, it's the Bible. Somebody said, you from the Middle Ages. No, I go further back than that. I'm from the Bible Ages, praise God. Hallelujah. In fact, that's up in the future anyways. Hallelujah. Because God's unchanging, amen. He steps outside of time. Hallelujah. It speaks, calls us. He loves us so much. He loves us so much. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin might live under righteousness by whose wounds we were healed. I should say that again, being dead to sin might live under righteousness. For man believes under righteousness with his heart. Look at the deception. Now men believe under unrighteousness with the heart. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And with the heart man believes under righteousness. Romans 10.10. 10. Do you have this salvation? Do you have this change? Huh? Don't run to your priest if you're Roman Catholic today because he's going to say everything I said is wrong and he's not going to take you to the Bible. He's going to take you to another book. Just like the Mormons would take you to another book. Don't run to this one and don't run to that one. And, and denominationalism because bottom line, they're going to take you to their little book. And their little book is better than anybody else's little book and it's their doctrinal concepts and beliefs. They're not taking you to the Bible. Why? I feel that way right now. There's an emergency. That's me. I, that's, if I sound like a fire alarm to you, there's a reason. That's just what God put on the inside of me, and it's going to be heard. The voice of it be heard throughout the city, throughout this region, because God so loves men, He's going to glorify the name of His only begotten Son. He's going to show the means by which He has delivered men from the power of Satan, has delivered them and washed them and cleansed them from all sin. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the living God. He should baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. Because John's really saying this. He's saying, you're not going to be fake around Jesus. He, he's going to throw, he's going to give you his mercy and his love for the requesting, but he's going to try you as gold tried in the fire. He's going to put the test to you. Listen to me. <laughs> and if, if I just took the time to this morning, which I can't because I've already got people mass exiting. <laughs> I got people already somehow falling asleep on me. I don't know how it's even possible other than it's just a devil needs to be dealt with. As I'm, I'm, you don't have to wonder what I'm thinking. Isn't that good? You get to make a real honest opinion about what's being said because, you know, and there's no politics going on here, man. I'm just going to lay it out as I am strongly impressed by God. Because we can see what it looks like to be captivated by His presence, to be one with the Spirit, to be born of Him. He's going to put the, he's going to put the trying upon you. I'm going to read a couple of verses of Scripture. I'm going to get my Bible just so that you guys will get your Bible. Okay? I know the leadership is going to have to give it and be an example. Look at Malachi chapter 3. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 3. I want to turn in those pages. I know we don't turn in pages anymore. <clears throat> Listen, for all of your iPhones and smartphones and whatever phones, you can get download an app that's called the Sound of Pages. <laughs> so that everybody knows that you're not texting, that you're actually turning in your smartphone to a scripture. Amen. Let me hear the rustling of the leaves. I just want to know that you're going, you understand, people, <clears throat> if you don't realize this, you can easily read through the Bible in six months. You can, with a fourth grade education, you can read through the Bible in six months. Let me say that one more time. With a fourth grade education, you can read through the Bible in six months. I'm mean, going to have to get the dictionary on some words. But most people have more than a fourth grade education. It's really simple. Take the total number of pages in your Bible and divide them by... Just divide them by 180 days. Okay? And, and then read that many pages a day. In fact, you'll, get, you'll find, you'll go, my goodness, this is nothing. This is nothing. I do this in 30 minutes. But as you begin to do this, you'll find out you can read the whole Bible in, in, in three months. Easy. If you just go ahead and give a little over an hour a day. It's a little over an hour a day. And it changes your life. Do it once, just give one year. Why don't you just give this year to it? Why don't you let 2014 be the year that you said, you know what? I'm going to quit having the guessing game and just live in my life by what someone, what, what someone else said. I'm going to go read the Bible enough to where I begin to get a 30,000 foot view, overview 
of what's being said. So scriptures can begin to connect themselves. And I guarantee you the Holy Ghost is going to get right in the big middle of it. He's going to connect the dots for you. And then all you got to do is go to your computer program, hit the search engine on any single word or subject or topic that the Lord lays on your heart. And now you have the opportunity to even get so, a, a great wealth of information and writings that date back, my goodness, all the way to the second century, third century. You, we, we've never had an opportunity ever before. We've never had so much and done such so little with it. Please believe me. We've never had so much of the Word of God right now. And I don't want to use the word disposal because that's basically what's happened. We've, ne we've never had the Word of God so much available to us as we have right now. And it seems that people just are so distracted. Oh, where is, your pro where is your pearl of great price? Where is your fire? Huh? The Lord Jesus come to baptize us in the Holy Ghost and fire. He's come to baptize us in the very presence of the living God. Immersed down. Think about it, dear people. Job had a hedge about him and Satan couldn't touch him. God's come baptized us in the glory cloud of his own presence. Think about that. But people's hearts have become so deceived. People's lives have become so deceived. They can listen to what I'm saying right now and agree with me and say, yeah, that's true. Amen. Praise God. I'm not lukewarm. Meanwhile, living a lukewarm life. I mean, there needs to be some honest and sincere evaluation. And I'm praying God will have such a Holy Ghost conviction. Hallelujah. <laughs> Moving through your life that you cannot lie to yourself anymore. You can't deceive yourself anymore. You've got to deal with things the way they are. Now, I know God's people can't handle too much more, so I'm going to try to wrap this up in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> of course, I'm just kidding you a little bit. <laughs> Malachi chapter 3. You know, the presence of the Lord is here. You know, Jesus is here. He's here. The power of the living God is here. He wants to touch you, fill you up with every good thing. All you got to do is just open your heart just a little bit. He come rushing in. I was in uh, I was in Cairo. I just come back from I just come back from Minya, Egypt, and uh, some of the assemblies of God there in Cairo, because uh, that's usually why when I went to Cairo, it was used for the assemblies of God. But some of the assemblies of God people in Cairo, they were all upset because there was people were getting healed at the Coptic Church. There was a move of God going on at the Coptic Church is back in two thousand and one, I think it was. Maybe you might remember that. So, the reality of it is people are saying, how could the moving of God be taking place at the Coptic church? It's supposed to be happening up here with us Pentecostals. No, Holy Ghost is going to start manifesting wherever the doors crack just a little bit. And you slammed it shut. So just open it up. Just crack it just a little bit, okay? Say, God, I want reality and truth. I want you to come and feel me. I'm hungry and thirsty for the things you described are supposed to be in my life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pray in Jesus' name you'll do that. Luke, Malachi chapter 3, look here with me. Behold, uh, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse, uh, um, verse 2. And I, well, I'll go ahead and just start at 1. Can I just, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Who's that? John. And the Lord shall, and the, and, and the Lord whom you are seeking shall suddenly come to the temple. But they were seeking him the wrong way. So, but, and so when he showed up, most of the leaders did not even recognize him at all. The poor people, the desperate people, the people who were real needy, they were able to see him because their need kept them from being blinded. The people who felt so distant and removed from God and there was no means or hope or access for them to get into the realms of glory were, 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 were able to see clearly because self-righteousness had not blinded their eyes. He came to suddenly to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, Jesus. Hallelujah. Whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord. Says Yehoah of armies. But who can abide the day of his coming? I'm living right now in the day of Jesus. 
You're living right now in the day of Jesus. The day of Jesus didn't come and go. The day of Jesus came and is here. He rose up from the dead with absolute power and authority over all the powers of darkness, over all sin. He died, let me just say this, because some people don't know this, Jesus Christ, the living God, died and went to hell so that you don't have to go there. On the third day, he rose up and there are many witnesses to that fact. Many, many religious people who would have, who would have had to deny the faith to confess that he rose from the dead. Deny the faith of the law of Moses to confess that he rose up from the dead. He surely rose from the dead. I am a witness of that because of the life-changing event that took place in my own life personally, not because of what? Not because my daddy's a preacher and my granddaddy's a preacher and my great-granddaddy's a preacher. I mean, I have my own experience personal with the living God, Christ Jesus, who appeared unto me, not as he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, but in a real and a true and a living way just the same. He came and changed me and touched me. And everything about my life took on a whole new dimension. Everything changed in my desires. Everything changed in the things concerning what I wanted to do with my life. It became God's will, not mine. It became the testimony of the Holy Ghost in my life, not the testimony of my own spirit. Who should be able to abide the day of His coming? He rose up from the dead, was seen of many witnesses for about 40 days. And then taken up into heaven. He there, he ascended and was exalted at the right hand of the Father. And he poured forth that which you both see and hear, said the Apostle Peter in Acts 2.33. He poured forth this baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. Expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. To sit there at the right end of God until the restoration of all things take place. And here you are in the very midst of your divine opportunity. Right now you're at the crossroads of eternity. What will you choose? Will you choose to to go on with your own life? Or will you take your life and trade it for the life that God's given you? Are you willing to lose your life? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For your life is far more than clothing. And your body far more than meat. Papa's made a way for you and I to be able to step over into a divine provision in a life realm of God's divine goodness and glory. All we have to do is be willing to take up our cross and deny ourselves. You cannot live for yourself and be right with God. He said, if you want to be my disciple, it's no more self-reign. Jesus, he could have done anything he wanted to do of himself and he didn't. He did the will of the Father. And living only for that purpose. We're in a great crisis right now. We're in a great conflict right now. At this very time, you are in the midst of a war over your soul. While you choose, Christ Jesus is the only one who has the way of escape. Christ Jesus is calling you, He's pleading with you. The Holy Ghost is calling you, He's pleading with you. Father is calling you. He's pleading with you. He's one, he wants to present you as a gift to his only begotten son. What will you choose? Who shall be able to abide the coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. His blood cleanses from all sin. But I'm telling you, his presence will refine everything about our, about our demeanor, about our conduct, about the way we live out our life. He's filled us with all of his nature, but his refining fire will expose and reveal everything that is an opposing nature or everything concerning the former conversation that we should slip back into. And if we do not, Stand in his presence and receive his instruction. We'll be sorted out. We'll be sorted out. You listen to me. I go go back and read Luke chapter 3. And you would hear what Luke said. What John said surrounding Jesus being the one that baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. His fan is in his hand. First he said, the axe is laid to the root of every tree. That does not bring forth fruit. 
it will be hewn down by the Messiah, by Christ Jesus, the Savior. He says, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor, his people, his household. He said, out the wheat he would gather into his garner, but the chaff, the words of men, the, lives, the life of humanism, the life uh, of living for self, shall be burnt with unquenchable fire. That's what the Lord Who shall be able to abide the day of his coming? And who shall be able to stand or appear before him? I appear before him right now. He's a refiner's fire. Look at him in Revelation chapter. Look at him in Revelation chapter 1. He stands there as a refiner's fire on fire. Huh? Everything about him is on fire. His eyes are even on fire. Uh, and what is he doing? He's standing there doing what? Ministering to his church. It's not about the tribulation. He's ministering to his church. He's ministering to his church. People, let the fear of the Lord grab a hold of your heart. The fear of the Lord will cause you to depart from evil. The fear of the Lord will cause you to hate rebellion. Huh? You'll respect the authorities that God's placed in your life. Instead of despising them, trying to run, it, run your own program. People think, listen, you must understand. God has a divine order. And that divine order is perfect and wonderful. Whether you understand it or not, that divine order is such a blessing. It will result in your eternal life. Huh? It will result in you being protected from every evil thing that would otherwise come and, 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 and destroy you. Because deception is powerful. I want to say this one more time. Listen to me. Satan is a master of his craft. He was able to deceive mighty angels who stood before God for eons of days. Mighty angels, cherubims, who were the ministers of Almighty God. He was able to deceive them and draw them away. You know, you, know, you and I are no, no, no possible comparison huh to mighty angels who beheld the face of father for eons of time to then them be deceived our only place of safety is the word of god our only place of safety is to do it his way just like he said it don't add to it because if you add to it you know what's going to happen your name will be taken from the book of life you know why because you add to it you're going to get deceived huh not because god is sitting there checking the manuscript make sure that your edits were good Come on. You add to it. These plagues shall be added to you. The plagues of this book. Because you add to it, you're going to be deceived. You take away from it. Your name will be taken away from the book of life. Because you're going to be deceived. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. See that you do and observe all that God has spoken. Let not these words depart out of your mouth. But speak them continually. Because man doesn't live by bread alone. But by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. God will not alter his ways for you or me. He's not, he didn't wait till I come up on the scene to get some bright idea so he can finally get some wisdom and insight and say, oops, I made a mistake. We're going to do it this way instead. Are you listening to me? He alone, Christ Jesus alone, the one man defeated Satan. He alone has the ways of life. Amen. Amen. I'm trying to wrap this up. <laughs> the more I stand here, the more on fire I get. Those are tongues of fire. Those are tongues of fire. They clothed in tongues. They looked like clothed in tongues of fire. They set upon each one of them. Somebody said, where are they at now? They sunk down into the belly. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes the Lord allows people around us to see fire. There were people here the other night saw tongues of fire, saw flashes of fire. It, it, you know, and uh, Father wants to do that, that's fine. If He wants to open up, manifest what's really going on in the realms of the Spirit. There's more going on around the Spirit while you see right now. This place is filled with angels, Holy Ghost is here. It's his church. Hallelujah. It's his church. Amen. Christ Jesus is here. Amen. Amen. He is. Somebody say, ah, oh, he's too busy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's really self-serving, isn't it? Think that, you know, you, 
build yourself up so much, think that he's going to drop in and visit you. No. Uh, no, it don't work that way. No, he's committed himself to us. It's just anybody who seeks his face and sincerity and truth, he's able to get around to all the meetings. Lord, I'm with you always. Behold, I'm with you always. Even in the world, in the world he said, go everywhere, preach my word. Now confirm my word with miracles. I'm going to preach his word. I'm going to say it just like I'm plastered Jesus all over it. Um, when our baby was born, we had just come back from Yanji, China, and then just continued to get in North Korea at the time. The Lord just didn't. Things happened. We weren't able to get in North Korea, but we come back and our old baby's born one pound, three ounces. And everybody says, well, she can't live. This is impossible. She can't live. Just, and if she does, she's going to be all messed up kind of thing. And I just told, I'm fortunate, blessed, I'm blessed. My son is in total 100% submission to me. If I tell him to do something, he will do it. And I'm so blessed that the woman that he married is a woman also who submitted to the living God. Thus being submitted to the living God, it's proof she submitted to me as well. Or anyone who speaks the word to her. Are you listening to me? And so I said, plaster the name of Jesus everywhere. I know that there, it's like the valley of the shadow of death. There's all these intimidating lying things, <clears throat> especially within the framework of the intellectualism of men, that would try to keep you from using the name of Jesus. Plaster the name of Jesus. The name, that name has power and authority. By the power of that name, I'm telling you right now, everything that Satan would try to do, everything that death and disease would try to do will absolutely be eradicated. And such is the case. And she's a beautiful three-year-old right now, almost. Where was she, right? Almost three now. And baby brother's on the way. And that's another, that's another miracle because it's like, oh, you know, that was such a terrible crisis in your body and, you know, because your body had such a terrible thing, this, this syndrome took hold of your body, the stinking devil, I mean, you know, he just tries to creep in any way he can. Uh, more than likely, you never have any children and, here, you know, I, we just said, praise God, you can have many children. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Father, so one, if you serve him, you'll be blessed. Your house will be blessed. Ha. Your seed will be blessed. I have proof that I'm walking with God. My seed is blessed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. They walk with God. You want to raise your kids so they're full of the Holy Ghost, so they're prophets and prophetess in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 Well, I'm just going to finish this. I'm not going to get to Isaiah 4 and 5. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. I don't believe I'm going to. It's already too late. You have to read that later. Who should abide the day of his coming? He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Father, I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I ask all of you to stand with me right now. <clears throat> 